every day from school, I'd come home, and I'd watch a couple shows, MASH, everybody had to watch MASH, Hogan's Heroes, and The Partridge Family. I love those shows. Well, two weeks ago, as you know, David Cassidy passed away at the age of 67 years of age. And his last words to his daughter, Kate, was this, so much wasted time. So much wasted time. So often we get in our life and uh, we get so confused on the priorities of life. As Cassidy had a lot of priorities goofed up in his life. At the end of his life when he had dementia. His last words are so much wasted time. So we have developed this month a series on time. This week is about wasted time, about way, what we need to do to understand what time does for us and how we can think about the end better than the beginning. But when you think about so much wasted time, there's a poem. I have just one minute, only 60 seconds in it, forced upon me and can't refuse it. Didn't seek it and don't choose it, but it's up to me to use it. I must suffer if I lose it, give account if I abuse it. Just a tiny minute, but eternity is in it. When we think about what Dr. Mays just said there, it is so true. That every moment of time, every conversation that we have, everything that we do has impact. And God has given to us a certain amount of time to do certain things with. And what we do with that time is very overwhelming for us. We see another man that just passed away this week. His name is Jim Neighbors. Uh, the old Andy Griffiths show in the Gomer Pile. You think at one time that we have life. And we see those reruns of these young men on these TV shows, David Cassidy being a, a chick magnet for the teenagers, and every, amen, somebody give me, amen. had to be a woman that said that, but, um, you know, you look past and you say, that, that, was, that was him yesterday, or that's what it was just on TV a couple days ago, but time passes quickly. You know, this is not a youth service, so our teenagers are not in here, so this is speaking to a lot of adults. And time passes very quickly. A missionary by the name of C.D. Studd said this, Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Well, I want to talk to you today about some priorities within our life. Priorities about looking to understand what God has in store for us. And when you're talking about time, there's a lot of regrets and there's a lot of joys in our past. We could look back and see, even this year, some great things that took place. But if you were like me, this year there's a lot of regrets that took place. Things that I have said or people that I have lost. Issues that we've gone through. It's a, it's a year. And within 30 days, 2017 is going to be over with. And we need to close 2017 properly. With the fulfillment of promises and the fulfillment of love and commitment. The past shapes us who we are today. The future is something that we long for. But so often we lose sight of the importance of the moment today. We get so caught up in things that have taken place in the past, good and bad, that so often that we feel like we're not worthy of today because of the mistakes of the past. Or so often sometimes we think the past was so wonderful, I really don't have anything to look forward to. But Jesus said to us, it's a priority to redeem the time that he's given to us. Whether it's with family or through relationships, we need to understand that today is the day that God has given to us. On Glenville's Facebook 
wall this week, there was a message to me. And I have no idea who it was from. And it just says, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And I tried to research where that came from and who sent that. And, and uh, it brought tears to my eyes because somebody in this church or somebody that, has an inf that we have an influence over was going through a major issue and was thinking about committing suicide. And when somebody gets to that point, there's struggles in their life. There's pain. And what do we do with somebody within that much struggles? I remember my brother lived in Manhattan, Kansas. And uh, I lived in Wamego, which was 15 miles away. And my brother tried to commit suicide. And I had to put him into a mental hospital for about two weeks. And he hated me. He hated me. I mean, he cussed me out one side and up down the other. But I cared more about him being alive than whether he thought I was doing the right thing. Six months after he tried to commit suicide, he was murdered. He was a young man. He was the best man at my wedding. And he was young. Best days of his life was ahead of him. But he got so captivated in stuff, in sin, that he couldn't enjoy the day. And he wanted to die. And he was successful. And I was thinking about wasted time, a wasted life. How sometimes the beginning is okay, but so often we really goof up the end. And how important it is to end well within our life, within our relationships, and with God. See, in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 8 through 10, it says, The end of the thing is better than the beginning. The patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Do not hasten in your spirit to be angry, for angry rests in the bosoms of fools. Do not say, why are the former better than these? For you do not inquire wisely concerning this. Why is the past better than the future? Why do sometimes we think, I will never get any better than what I've had? When God wants to give to us a time to redeem and to give us a blessing into the future. Maybe last year was a great year. Maybe you graduated from college. And maybe you're in a new relationship and you can look back and you can look at last year with a smile on your face and say it was wonderful. I don't know if the Rittenhallers would say that or not, but it was a brand new day getting married. It was a wonderful day. And then Mariah's been talking to me. She goes, why did I ever do that? I mean, the guy's a total goober head. And, you know, she may think that a wonderful day when you stand up and get married. And that's wonderful things. It doesn't stop there. The day that you get married, the day that a wonderful thing takes place within your life is the beginning point. And we have to have dreams into the future. Whether it's 5, 10, 15, 20 years into the future. We have to aspire ourselves not to be satisfied in today. We can enjoy today. We can redeem the time today. But tomorrow can be better than what we've ever had in the past. And what we've ever had in the present. So let me give you three simple points. The first thing is we need to leave the past. We need to leave the past. I've been pastoring this church for 19 years. And uh, when I became pastor here, this church had a great reputation. Some great pastors. Um, and I had to fight the, the problem. And I, I hope I don't offend anybody that's been here for a long time. But this church had the concept that the best days of this church was behind them. We had some great preachers and we did great things. And this is what this pastor did. And this is what that pastor did. I said, I come in here. I said, I said well, there's nothing I can live up to. If everything was so great in the past, I will never live up to that. 
And there's one thing that I had to overcome is what they did in the past was in the past. What we're going to do today matters. Because what we're going to do today changes people's lives today. Young kids, young adults, young marriages are here today to impact. And what they did in the past was great. Thank God for that. But what we had to do is we had to quit pitching our tent in the past and open up the door to the future. And so when we started doing that, not thinking about what the great things were back in 1956 and 1970s and 1980s, and those were great days. But the best days are tomorrow. The best days are changing people's lives and ministering to individuals. We have to leave the past. And leave the past behind you. I say that for two different reasons. Sometimes the arrogance of the past makes us live in the past because it was great. Awesome days. Best days of my life. But then some days the past for some of us were very bad. Horrendous in certain areas. Whether it was because of loss of a husband or a wife or a sibling or even a child. Sometimes the past is terrible. And what we have to do to get rid of the past is we have to allow God to heal us. And there's sometimes that when we cannot get rid of the past because of pain and bitterness, it's because of unforgiveness. Sometimes we have to say in our heart, in our minds, to maybe our mom or dad that's already passed, I'm sorry. Forgive me because of what I have done. And mom, I'm not going to hold you accountable to the issues that you've done for me. Or maybe it's somebody within your life that really hurts you. And it may be to the point that this man or this woman wrote to me on Facebook that I'm going to die. Sometimes because of that bitterness and resentment, we are so captivated that we have no desire to live any longer. See, I've had two best friends commit suicide. And when you get the message that two of your high school friends that you were best friends with committed suicide, it starts making you think about what could have I done better? What could have I done? I have to think about it. I have to be self-aware about it. We have to think about the past. And we have to get rid of the past. Paul said this, Not that I have already attained, or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may not hold, that I may lay hold of what Jesus Christ has also laid a hold of me. Brethren, do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, Forgetting those things which are behind, I reach forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal, the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. As the body of Christ, our goal has to be, what is God going to do through me tomorrow? Not what has God done with me in the past. Those are great things. We can celebrate what God has done in the past. But we can't live what God has done with us in the past. What we have to do is say, God, what are you going to do with me into the future? What are we going to do? The Bible says in Psalms 30, 11, you have turned my mourning into dancing. There are times of adversity. There are times of low places within our life that we don't even think the morning's going to rise. And we just want to go. But the Bible says he's going to turn our mourning into dancing. And here's how he does that. If we have to look into the future. We have to say, Lord, give me an opportunity. Give me something to live for. Give me an ability to serve and to look into the future. So we have to forget the things that you're behind. And the second thing, we have to press on towards hope. Press on towards hope. If the ending is better than the beginning, press on to the end. Press on to the end. Every morning... We need to wake up and say, God can use me today. In every calamity, in every pain, in every illness, God can use me. 
There's people that are struggling. There's people that are hurting. And in their calamity, they become inward focused. They're hurt. What do we do? What do we do? We can wake up in the morning and say, God, use me. Use me to say something positive. Use me to minister to somebody. Paul said this in uh, 1 Timothy. I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. Finished my course. And the future is laid up for me in the crown of righteousness. Not only to me, but to all who love his appearing. The whole Bible is looking forward, not backward. I have fought the fight. I have kept the faith. But what is in front of me is the joys of heaven. What we must do is we must understand that Christ wants us to live into the future. Now, in, in my funeral sermons, I, I use this scripture. And the scripture says, uh, that city who's an architect and builder is God. He's going to wipe tears from our eyes. And there'll be no more death, no mourning, and no pain. He is going to take care of us. That's why the better days are into the future. And sometimes we can say, what we've gone through is horrendous. But as the body of Christ, as the family of God, we have to understand there's a bigger picture than where we've gone through. And there's a bigger picture of what we're going through today. And we have to understand that one day I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to be held accountable to everything that we have done and everything that we have said. When we look at what God wants to do with us, we talk about the end times, the eschatology, if you would, talking about what's going to take place in the future. And God has promised us approximately 70 years. And in those 70 years is a lot of pain. I'm 54 years old, so I got 16 more years. And I don't know where that rakes you guys, but uh, approximately 70 years is the average. And redeeming the times means this. If I'm 54 years old and God promised me approximately 70 years, I have 16 years left. You do the math in your own life. What are you going to do to end well? What are you going to do? Are we going to coast mode into the future and so much wasted time? Or are there things that you need to do and people that you need to talk to and things that you need to forgive and things that you need to receive? Because the time is at hand. And if the Bible says redeem the times, means make aware, open up your heart and do something with what God has given to us. James chapter 1 verse 2, it says, Consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. Testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect result so you may be complete, lacking in nothing. The things that you go through, the issues of life, each and every one of us could come up here and you could tell your story. And you would have tears in everybody's eyes because of the junk that you had to go through. The pain of your life. The agony of your life. And it's hard. But what God wants to take is the agony and the pain and the bitterness and the unforgiveness of your life. And he wants to wrap it up and he says this. He says, consider all joy when you encounter various trials. Because when you've gone through trials, and when you go through life and your life is in agony and your kids are rebellious and your problems of life, and then you give it to God and say, God, I can't do this. And you give it to God and you walk away. And you say, I can only do one thing. I can ask God to bless my family. Bless my kids. Our society today delegate or relegates to our children who they believe in and what they do. And that's the parent's job. 
That's our responsibility. Fight the good fight means to struggle. It means sometimes the only way that you're going to grow muscles is that you put pressure against your muscles. The only way that you're going to understand what happiness is is if you understand what struggling is. And after you've gone through a struggle, then you understand what happiness is. But so often, sometimes we never struggle, so we really don't know what true happiness is. We just live our life as a robot. But when we go through struggle, we go through pain, we understand the heartache, we understand what the struggle is. The struggle, the Greek word for struggle is agon. Agon, which is where we get our word agony from. So to struggle means to agonize. And how do we handle as a church, as a Christian family, to struggle or to have agony? When we have agony and when we struggle, if we struggle by ourselves, that's when bitterness takes place. That's when resentment takes place. But in our struggles, in our issues of life, with our family, with our kids, at job, in our finances, when we struggle as a child of God, that's when we go to God and we say, I need you to work this out. And he says, consider it all joy when you struggle in your life. Because out of your struggle, I'm going to make you somebody that you cannot even comprehend you can be. Because what we look at is we look at the self-awareness of our life and we see who we are. We see our pain and we see our weaknesses, see our failures. And sometimes we start believing our eyes instead of believing his words. And he tells us we're an ambassador unto Christ. We're a child of God. We're joint heirs to the kingdom of God. And we think, yeah, that's Bible stuff, but they really don't know me. But yet Jesus does know us. And sometimes we get so caught up in who we are in our own mind, we cannot comprehend what God can do through us. So we have to allow God to give us hope and give us a dream. But in order to do that, where the rubber hits the road is today, we need to live in the present. Live in the present. So often, because of pain, our present is in disarray. And we're so used to the disarray within our homes. We are so satisfied with the way it is, with our job, with our finances. We are not satisfied in the present. And so often, because we're not satisfied in the present, we do not think that there's a positive future. And so often, because of the present has been made by our past, we're not happy with where we are because we weren't happy with where we were. And as, as a result, there's not going to be a future for me. And if we live in that negativity, in that bondage, if you would, of identity of ourselves because we think who we are, but we don't understand who God thinks we are, we're going to be miserable. Paul's perspective from the past to the future and to the present says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sakes. When we understand that Jesus died for me, he purchased my salvation, and he is going to use me for his good use. Not for what I want but for what he wants. See, there's a past. In spite of our struggles, we cannot be destroyed. Despite of our sins. I, I just had the privilege of teaching Pastor Al's uh, young marriage class. Some of them old marriage class. Doug is in there, so it's an old marriage class too. But uh, marriage class, and I had the privilege of talking about child rearing. And I told the story that is so emotional to me. I told the story about the day my mom had a stroke. And after you have a stroke and your mom had a stroke, it kind of starts thinking about how life truly is. 
And uh, before my mom had a stroke, my dad had cancer, and he had he'd been fighting cancer for seven years. And uh, my dad was a big boy like me, and he ended up being down to about 115 to 120 pounds. And uh, when my mom had her stroke, she uh, got very irritated and very aggressive and threw my dad across the room and his head hit the counter and he had black and blue marks all over his arm and he couldn't control my mom so he had to call 911 and the police came and uh, they had to restrain my mom and, and uh, end up taking her to the hospital and uh, so she was up in the hospital and my dad was one week from death and uh, um, he couldn't go into the he couldn't go into the ambulance, so he got into a car that he wasn't supposed to be in without a license, and he tried to drive to the hospital. And he got lost in what may go a town of three thousand. He got lost in the seven blocks from from his house to the hospital. So he stopped, and somebody said, "Just follow me. I'll take you to the hospital." So my mom and my dad ended up being in the same hospital room. And uh, my mom was comatose for about three days. Which gave me the opportunity to talk to my dad, just him and I, about life. About his failures and my failures. And it was one of the sweetest times. I didn't even realize how close to death he was. And it was on a Saturday night. I said, well, Dad, I got to drive back. I got to preach tomorrow. So I drove back on a Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening. And I got a phone call about 3 o'clock in the morning that my dad passed away. And I thought, my dad? My mom's the one that's comatose. She's the one that had the stroke. And they said, no, it was your dad. So I booked back down to Wamego and, and my mom woke up. And the times that my dad and I had over those three days were very special. Talking about redeeming the times. If I can give you any advice at all, is if you're struggling with somebody, redeem the time. You have no idea how quick that time can go. If there's somebody within your soul or within your pain that you need to talk to, even if it was their fault, Redeem the time. Because when I left my dad's hospital room, I was full of joy. It was the first time in years my dad and I sat down and talked about things that were important. We may have talked about a lot of different things, about sports, about the weather, about hunting and all kinds of stuff. But we never really got down to talk about life. And I remember him saying this, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? He said, I'm too weak, I'm too old, I'm too feeble to take care of your mother. What am I going to do? I said, Dad, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll take care of it. You talk about living in the present. It was a very sobering, sobering conversation. And it was very heartbreaking when I got that phone call. But I had the privilege of standing up at my father's funeral and preaching a message of hope. Because my father received Jesus as his Lord and Savior after I got saved. And his bitterness, his anger, the way that he handled everything was changed. And I got to share with the congregation about God's love and how God can change us. But so often, we do not live in the present. In spite of our struggles, God can use us. The past have a life that Jesus was worth dying for. Jesus died for your sins and mine. And let's live a life that's pleasing unto him. When we live a life pleasing to him, in our past, in our present, in our future, God can do great things. In the present, what we do is the outer man is decaying. It's, that's the truth. Anybody here that's not getting older? Um, 
use this all the times, but you know, 100% of the people that live, they're going to die. And what we do in that life is very important. Um, and the older we get, the quicker it gets. But what we also have to understand is the future. Our mortality is swallowed up by life. For we are who this tent is groaning, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may swallow up by life. You know, life goes fast. Overwhelmingly fast. Uh, it, looks, it seems like it was just yesterday I was in high school. I had the privilege this week of meeting my, my old high school wrestling coach and driver's ed teacher. I haven't talked to him in 35 years. And we had a conversation. And we reminisced about 35 years ago. And you know, the funny thing about that is when he carried on a conversation, you know what my mind did? I transported myself back into those days. I looked at him as that 30 year old coach and I looked at myself as that 16 year old boy and the things that he told me, the things that we talked about, I could relive that. But here's the problem, I can't relive it. What I did, I did. The sins that I've committed, I've committed. I can't go back and relive my life. I can go back and say, Lord, forgive me of the stupidity that I've done. But what I can do is right now, is I can make a change for the better today. Whether you're 18 years old or 75 years old, it makes no difference. What makes a difference is we have to redeem the time that is ahead of us today. All that is said and all that is done in our pain and our agony, he says this, Consider it all joy when the trials of life come. Because the trials of life allow us to understand the joys of life. We will never be able to understand the joy of having our kids healthy unless our kid was unhealthy. We will never understand what it's like to have money and to enjoy money until we get to the point that we have no money. Until we understand that money is not going to buy us happiness. It's what we do with what we have. There's a poem that I want to finish with. It's called, The One Day I Will Die. What Will Happen? On the day that I die, a lot of change and the world will still be busy. On the day that I die, all the important appointments I made will be unattended. On the day that I die, the many plans I have yet to complete will remain forever undone. The calendar that ruled so many of my days will now be irrelevant to me. All the material things I chased and guarded and treasured will be left in the hands of others to be cared for or discarded. On the day that I die, the words of my critics which burdened me so much to cease to sting to capture me anymore, they will be unable to touch me. The arguments I believe I'd won will here's to serve and bring me any satisfaction of solace. All the noisy incoming notifications, texts, calls will go unanswered. The great urgency of my call will be quieted. On the day that I die, my many nagging regrets will all be resigned to the past where they should have been anyway. Every superficial worry about my body that it will never labor over about my waistline or hairline or frown line will just fade away. My careful crafted image, the one I worked so hard to shape for others to see, will be left in the complete of their imagine. The sterling reputation I once struggled and greatly to maintain will be a little concern of me anymore. All the small and large anxieties that stole sleep from me each night will be rendered powerless. And so knowing this, while I'm still alive, I'll try to remember that my time is fleeting and so very precious. And I'll do my best not to waste a second of it. I'll try not to squander the priceless moments worrying others of things that should have happened the day that I die. Because many of those things are either not my concern or beyond my control. Those things which they have, 
those things which have way to keeping you from living even as you live vying for your attention competing for your affection they rob you of the joy of the present don't let your life be stolen every day by all that you've done and led by matters that did not make any difference because on the day that you die the fact is that much of it is very simply won't matter yes you will die one day but before that day comes Live well. Live strong. Because the day that you die, you're going to be face to face with Jesus. See, I believe life is relegated down to relationships. It's relegated down to how I live my life. How I honor other people. And the beginning is good. But the end is is sweet because the influence that I have the influence that you have over people's lives is not about buying their love it's about being their love ministering to them caring for them and loving them because every one of us one day will die and the legacy that you live the legacy that you leave is how you lived and one day you will die. It's very important to live before you die. David Cassidy. So much wasted time. We all waste time. I was at my office just this week. I was studying. And then, you know, I'm on all kinds of medication. So I can say this because I was all medicated up. I found myself in my office as I was trying to read sermons, as trying to do different things. I found myself just staring off to space. Anybody else like that? Just staring off to space. Like, what am I doing? What am I doing? And sometimes in life, we can put our life on coast mode. And just play the game of life. And just stare off in space. And not deal with what God wants us to deal with. Not to communicate to others the need of Jesus. Not to discipline your children. Not to love God. Just put your life on coast mode. And in your mind in the present is everything is about me. And we have to always remember to live a godly life. It's not about you. It's about him. And if we honor him in our life. We can enjoy the present. And we can have a great future. So in your struggles, consider it all joy. Because once you have the struggles, the agony, the fight within your life, what happens when we give that over to God, we can joy and see the peace and know that God absolutely loves us. Does it mean that the struggles are going to be gone? doesn't mean the relationships are all going to be restored. What it means is I'm going to give it to God. I'm going to walk away from it. I'm going to ask God to bless it. I'm going to ask God to work through it. But here's the issue. You can ask God to bless it. And you can ask God to work through it. But when you're petitioning unto God for him to work in certain areas within your life, you know the first thing he's going to make you do? is to participate in it. You're not just going to pray for somebody. He wants you to minister to that somebody. He doesn't want you just to pray about something. He wants you to engage that something. See, Christianity is not church. Christianity is the body of Christ living in the present, telling people about the future. We can't tell people about the past. We can't glory in anything that we have done in the past. The Bible says the only thing that we can glory in is the cross. And glory in what he has done for us. And we can glory in the cross and tell, Jesus, uh, tell people about Jesus because he's changed our lives. So the past is overwhelming. We've got to get rid of the past. The agony of the past. Your sin of the past my sin of the past I have to get rid of it because then and only then 
I can have a present. I can open up my eyes with a joyful heart and know that Jesus loves me. The greatest thing about my salvation is this. Jesus doesn't see my past. You ready for that? That's what forgiveness is all about. Jesus does not hold me accountable to my sin because I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And if Jesus does not hold me accountable to my past, why am I holding myself accountable to the past? There may be consequences because of my past, but the sin that I committed is under the blood of Jesus Christ. And he said he's going to separate as far as the east is from the west. He's going to bury it in the deepest sea. He's not going to bring it to his remembrance any longer. If that's the past, I can have a future. And because I can have a future, I can long. I can long for the day that I stand before Jesus. In my life, I have sinned. In my life, I have been a terrible person. But I know that when I see Jesus, because I serve him, because I love him, even though I'm not perfect by any means and neither are you, here's his words that we long to hear. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. In your own works, you're no good. I'm no good. I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. I just happen to be saved by grace. But Jesus looks at me and he died on the cross for all of my sin. He cleansed me from all of my unrighteousness. Upon all of my sin was laid upon the iniquity of him. And Jesus bore my sin so I can have heaven. That's the greatest gift that you could ever have. Moms and dads, the greatest gift that you could give your kids is Jesus. The greatest gift. It's not about a present under the tree. It's about time that you spend redeeming the times, loving your kids. Even if you have error, even if you made mistakes, redeem the time. Love your kids. They will love you back.